fills. There'll be the types of monitoring you need to do to reinstate an area after your facility has been shut down. You need to consider what environmental monitoring you'll do if any maintenance needs to occur around the time of processing. So for example, if a HVAC grill needs to be changed, what will you do? You also need to monitor your microbiology laboratories to show that um, there's not high levels of contamination there that might in turn contaminate your environmental monitoring samples. There's also possibly a need for fungal monitoring and if you have nitrogen gas lines, certainly anaerobic monitoring. Other considerations which will inform your plan is when to take samples, uh, how the room should be when you sample. So if there's normally people in the room, you should really sample when there are people in the room. Or if there's a certain item of equipment normally running, then you should really monitor when the item of equipment is running. Um, who should take the samples? Do you allow production staff to take them? Or should it always be independent QC sampling? This is something that's explored in the module. Are test controls necessary? For example, would you use a negative control when you're plating out a set of swabs, for instance? So you've seen from that that there's a lot of questions. Some of these are answered in the module, some are only opinion, but the whole idea of this is to get you to think and to reason about your own monitoring plans. Okay, so it's time for another exercise. This exercise is what are the main sources of microbiological contamination within the pharmaceutical facility? So again, I'd like you to go away and think and to write down some ideas and maybe go into small groups as well. Um, and at the end of the exercise, I'll give you my thoughts. So again, it would be useful after five or ten minutes to have a couple of people in the room report back and to share your ideas before I um, give you mine. So if the person in the uh, room looking after the video could now pause it, and I'll be back with you in a moment. Okay, well I hope that was a useful exercise and I hope you've had fun sharing your ideas. I'll run through some of the things that I've thought of. So, source of contamination. We have things in the air, such as dust, which might carry spores in particular, and most importantly, skin flakes. People shed a lot of skin, tens of thousands of skin cells per day. We then have water. Water is a problem in clean rooms and you can't get away from it in your lower grade clean rooms. It's because it's not only a vector, as in it spreads contamination around, but it also is a growth source for microorganisms. So long periods of contact, particularly with ground negatives and water, will start to get a lot of cell division. Uh, there's also the manufacturing equipment itself, surfaces and consumables, and then we have people. People, as you'll see many times throughout the module, I, I say many times that people are the main source of contamination in clean rooms. So with people particularly, we have skin flakes. As I mentioned before, lots of shedding of skin cells from operators. There's also contamination from hair, hair follicles. Hair follicles do contain a number of anaerobic bacteria, lots of propionic bacteria. Saliva and spittle clothing material, fingerprints, the acts of coughing, general handling, and cosmetics, and cosmetics are things that um, shouldn't really be worn in higher grade clean rooms because of the tendency to flake away and deposit contamination. Um, you also see on this slide here, um, I've written, written down the uh, sources of contamination again, so some examples some general types of contamination associated with those, and some aspects of control strategy. And this is just an example from the module. The module goes into far more detail. So we have people. People deposit bacteria and fungi, and we can minimise that by wearing correct types of clean room garments, gloves and masks. And take a second example, we have air. 
here we have lots of, again, a fungal and bacterial risk. And we can control that by filtering the air into our clean rooms. And those of you who are interested in taking Module 4 of PMAP, there's a big emphasis on clean room design in there as well. Okay, so I mentioned clean rooms. What is a clean room? Well, a clean room is a room especially designed to create a clean environment for pharmaceutical processing. And clean refers to the concentration of airborne particles in a given volume of air. Now, so in the international standard ISO 14644, the volume is defined as one cubic metre. Um, and um, in addition to that, because ISO 14644 is only referring to particles, EU GMP also talks about permitted numbers of microorganisms. So in both of those we have a definition of particular microbial control that we can begin to associate with the clean room concept. And there's a very simple diagram on the screen there about uh, how clean rooms clean. So they have a, an HVAC system, that's heating, ventilation and air conditioning. The air conditioning element of that, it, it forms the air handling system. And uh, basically air is supplied in through a HEPA filter, high efficiency particular air filter, takes out most of the contamination, provides clean air into the room and then the air is then extracted. So the protective aspects of clean rooms are we control the number of particles in the air, we control the number of microorganisms in the air or those that might land on surfaces. We uh, make sure that the room is regularly supplied with clean air being pumped in and this is assessed by counting the number of air changes per hour and um, a modern design clean room would have anything in, have something well in excess of 20 air changes per hour more likely over 40 air changes per hour. For uh, unidirectional airflow devices we have air velocity that's the uh, speed that the air gets pumped into the laminar airflow cabinet and it's designed there to sweep away contamination. We also have to look at airflow patterns, smoke studies around that. Uh, we also have the filtering of the air, I mentioned the HEPA filters earlier. We also have pressure differentials between clean rooms of different grades and this means that the clean room, the cleaner clean room is at a higher pressure to the clean room of a um, lower grade so the air blows out and the air cannot blow in. And for aseptic filling we have requirements for temperature and humidity and that's mainly designed for operator comfort and to stop the operators from perspiring too much. Okay, well it's time for another exercise. So again I'd like you to go into groups and I'd like you to consider the types of microorganisms that you might find in clean rooms. Again, spend five to ten minutes on this, go into small groups, if you can report back and share your ideas and then I'll um, go through some of the uh, ideas I've got on subsequent slides. So if the person uh, responsible for the video could now pause it and I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Okay, well, I'm pleased to be back and I hope you found that an interesting exercise and got some valuable contributions. Okay, so here are um, some of the types of microflora. So we find uh, lots of uh, Micrococcus and Staphylococcus species because they are very heavy to the microbial ecology of the skin. We all get some types of uh, bacillus, which we might carry in on our clothing and our footwear, and particularly also found on cardboard and materials. Lots of criny bacteria, and that's very common to the upper body torso and the arms. There'd be some anaerobic bacteria like propionic bacteria, which are common to hair follicles and are found in relatively high density on the forehead. 
There will be some fungi, um, particularly uh, a low number of yeast like Candida and then a number of filamentous fungi like uh, Trichophyta and Aspergillus penicillium. There will also be gram negative rods in the clean room if there is a water source. Gram negative rods are not something you want to find in uh, aseptic filling areas, but early areas where there's wash bays, you will get some. I'd like to just touch on something you may find interesting, and that's called the Human Microbiome Project. So, the human microbiome, or the human microbiota, is an aggregate of the microorganisms that reside on the surface and deep layers of the skin, in the saliva, in the mouth, in the eyes, in the gastrointestinal tracts, and it's the totality of the bacteria, fungi, and archaea. And some of the recent findings from this have given us some useful information about um, what we might find in clean rooms. So there's a diagram on the slide there. Um, what uh, you'll really see that in more detail in the actual course literature. So don't worry about squinting too hard on the screen. Uh, it's really designed to say that the human body is a interesting ecology of microorganisms. You find different microorganisms in different parts of the human body, in different numbers, different types. Um, so the types of organisms that you recover in the clean room, if you think they come from a person, there's different ecological mapping that can be done to see where they may have come from. Uh, so this human microbiome of the skin has been massively advanced through some of the latest genotypic identification techniques. And they're looking for the highly conserved part of most microorganisms, and that's the 16S rRNA genes that are found from lysed microbial DNA. So we now know that there's a considerable diversity of species, there's variations between different parts of the body, that people differ, by uh, geography, age and gender, and that our microbiome does change over time. And uh, the diagram here also um, illustrates the uh, differences in population and diversity of the microorganisms. Okay, so all these people are in the clean rooms with this rich diversity of uh, different bacteria and fungi. But we can protect our clean rooms with appropriate gowning, masks, gloves and suits, through the use of protective airflows, the unidirectional airflow cabinet, and with barrier technology. So by using uh, isolators or uh, a step down from the isolator, the RAB system, RAB's is restricted access barrier system, like a glove port. Okay, it's time for another exercise. And this exercise is looking at non-sterile products. So this is, what are the important factors to be considered when assessing contamination detected within a non-sterile product? You can also broaden this to consider what might be found in the environment as well. So again, if you go into groups, you may want to take maybe a little bit longer for this exercise, 10 to 15 minutes, but um, if you finish sooner, that's fine. Again, in your groups, at the end of it, if someone can feed back, and if you could have a group discussion into some of your findings, and uh, I'll give some of my thoughts uh, at the end of the exercise. So if the person recall, uh, playing the video can now pause it, and I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Okay, I'm pleased to be back. Hope that was a challenging and interesting exercise. Here are some of my thoughts. Okay, so some factors to consider. Well, first of all, what's the function of the product? Uh, what's its intended use? What's the type of contamination? And how many microns have we seen? And how do all those things come together? So, uh, 
for instance, um, something that a product that's put into the eyes is going to be at far greater risk than a cream that's rubbed into unbroken skin. But the type of contamination may be a risk. A, uh, if if uh, a product rubbing on the skin is to go into a broken wound, then a gram negative of pseudomonas would be very dangerous. But a uh, non-pathogenic staphylococcus, like staphylococcus epidermidis, may well not be. It also might depend on how many organisms are seen, a low level contamination or a high level contamination. Um, it's also important that contamination of microorganisms in products from the environment doesn't necessarily mean it will harm a patient, because if you find something in the product, all different things can happen. The microorganisms may die, they might survive but not grow, so the product has a microstatic effect. The microorganisms though might metabolise, grow and multiply and be a risk. Or the microorganisms might be transferred from somewhere that isn't a risk to somewhere that clearly is a risk. Okay, I'd like to move on to a scenario. Supposing you do some environmental monitoring and you find, do find an increase in gram-negative rods. What might have caused this? And I'm using this, uh, this is one of a number of exercises in the course module that helps you think about risk assessment and out-of-limits investigations. So, we're dealing with uh, gram-positive rods. Um, so this can indicate a problem with the HVAC system. Um, after the operator, after the people going into the clean rooms, then uh, contamination of the environment uh, through air systems is generally regarded as a risk. There's also a risk of items being transferred into the room. So you may want to investigate the air supply, pressure differentials, whether any building works have taken place recently. And in terms of remedial action, you probably want to go in pretty quickly with a sporicidal disinfectant. Okay, so that was ground positive rods. Now it's your turn. Go into your groups and think about what might cause an increase of ground negative rods within the clean group. So again, spend 10 minutes or so on the exercise when you're finished, have someone report back from each group, share your thoughts and ideas, and then I'll be back with some of mine. So if we could pause the video, and I'll be with you again in a few minutes' time. Okay, pleased to be back. So this was gram-negative rods in clean rooms. What may have caused this thing? Okay, some possible sources. Well. You may have a water source, so you may want to have a look at some of your water data. What's the quality of water you're getting from your water outlets? Have you had any leaks, spills? Are you washing equipment? Is there an opportunity for aerosol, aerosol generation? Are there pools of water? Are there risks from drains? Are you in a high humid area? Um, do you want to look for any damaged surfaces or unsealed surfaces where water may accumulate and you may have microorganisms harbouring? You also want to have a look at whether your disinfectants are working properly and um, incorrect cleaning methods may also enhance contamination. So these are some of my thoughts. I'm sure you found some equally good ideas of your own and this is just an example of some of the things that you encounter as you work through the module. In terms of actions through these ground negative rods, you probably want to sanitise your drains or we'll have a look at them. Are you getting back contamination from the drains? Uh, splashback, aerosol, standing water. If it gets very serious, you find it in your water system, you may want to undertake a sanitisation exercise of your water system. Disinfection of surfaces and drains damage and replace seals. Maybe you want to try and dehumidify the area. Check your disinfectant resistance. 
check that the staff are keeping the areas as clean as and dry as possible and ensure the equipment is cleaned correctly. Okay, now to have a look at risk assessment. Risk assessment forms a very core part of the module and it's um, very important that any risk assessment that you undertake and you do as exercises or assignments or even when it comes to the exam, that you're drawing upon the principles in ICH Q9 which is based on quality risk management. And this can help inform such factors as um, times of monitoring, frequencies of monitoring, when and where to monitor. Another important aspect is out of specification, out of limits results investigations. So some important things to do when you do get environmental monitoring excursions is to identify the microorganism and to compare it with, if you're non if you're non stales particularly, whether you have any um, objectionable microorganisms. You also, when you get uh, action level excursions, you want to review the activities of the area, how well the equipment's functioning, interview the people. You want to review cleaning records and review data and trends. You want to uh, have a good monitoring program to make sure you have good methods of detection. And ideally you want to find the root cause or the most probable root cause. It's important that your out of limits results are communicated with the local managers, that you reinforce training of people, you may want to sample at an increased frequency, you may want to do extra cleaning, you may need to change your procedures, you may want to check your disinfectant efficacy, you may want to check that you have good clean room design, you may want to modify your HVAC system. You may want to determine the trend, you may want to undertake additional sampling, you may want to review recent environmental monitoring and trends and see if there's a connection, has something happened elsewhere. It's important to speciate the microorganism, that offers clues about where contamination may have come from. You may want to interview people, you probably want to check room and equipment cleaning records, you may want to determine if there's a product impact and if the product needs to be quarantined and use all of that to formulate various corrective and preventative actions. So there's quite a long list there but it's a uh, important list. Coming back to risk assessment, that's useful in terms of uh, working out where to locate the locations of monitoring in the clean rooms. And here, HACCP or Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points is extremely useful. So, for example, you probably want to put your monitoring locations close to the product. You want to consider whether air and surfaces will be in contact with the product. Uh, it's more likely for aseptically filled products that you want to take uh, more sites and frequent monitoring. And um, you need to consider how often you should monitor. There's also a section in this uh, course about parametric release. It's mentioned here because environmental monitoring feeds into parametric release, but PMAP Module 4 goes into the concept of parametric release and terminally sterilised products in greater detail. But it's all around making important and informed assessments at the time of processing and showing that we are.